We're finishing uh, the, the uh, book of Genesis. And we know, of course, that the book of uh, Bratius does not have that many mitzvot in it. Right? How many commandments of the 613 are in the book of Bratius? Two, three. 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 three, right. What, what are the three? Uh, right, so the first one is, right, uh-huh, and one, one more? Right, very excellent, very good. So uh, three out of the 613 are in this Chumash. Uh, the first is procreation, to be fruitful and multiply. The second is circumcision. And the third is we don't eat uh, the negative commandment. We don't eat from the sciatic nerve. That's why you can't get a good sirloin steak, essentially, uh, because uh, removing the uh, sciatic nerve from the hindquarters is extremely difficult. And therefore, most, in most uh, Jewish slaughterhouses, they just sell the hindquarters uh, to the goyim. Now, the thing is this, though. So the purpose of Chumash Bereshis is obviously not to teach me that much halacha, because there isn't that much law in it. But it does teach me about the basic values of Judaism, and it teaches me um, the overall aims. And, of course, it gives us the foundational history, not only of how the world was created, but how the Jewish people were created through the lives of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and the tribes. And, of course, you know, people say, you know, I know in Ur Sameach we always have all sorts of debates and discussions. How do you know the Torah is from heaven? You know, all of these uh, issues that, that are discussed. Let me point out uh, maybe a non-intellectual type of proof that people sometimes give. And that is, hey, the Torah must have been written by God because if we were writing our own story, we would never tell it in such a negative way, meaning to say there are so many things we did wrong that, you know, certainly uh, we would have covered it up. But Hashem is the God of truth, and we need to examine everything that happens, the good and the bad and the ugly, and to understand, of course, that on one hand, the, the avos and the imahos and the shvatim are infinitely greater than, than we are. And even the things that look like sins have to be understood in a deeper way. But still, we learn from the mistakes as well as the, as well as the successes. So now I just want to focus a little bit in this last parsha before Yaakov's death, he calls together his sons, and he gives each tribe, or each son that's going to be the founder of a tribe, a distinct blessing. And this highlights the idea that he doesn't simply generically bless his children, but each one is different, each one is distinct. We see the same thing with Moshe Rabbeinu in the very last parsha of the Torah. Before Moshe Rabbeinu dies, in Zos Habracha, that's the parsha we read on Simchas Torah, Every tribe gets a blessing. Tribes are apparently a big deal in the Torah. Uh, each tribe had its own section of land in the land of Israel. Each tribe had its own nasi, its own prince. They had their own flag in the desert. They had separate places. And in fact, let me just uh, give you a, a very, very sad story in our history, but, but it, all, it also illustrates the importance of tribes. In the book of Judges, so in the book of Judges, uh, this, this was the period of time after the death of Yehoshua, before we had a king. So we were ruled by a succession of judges. And there's a constant refrain in the book of Judges. But Yamim Ahim, in those days, there was no melech, over a 300-year period, there was no melech be Israel. There was no king in Israel. Ish kol hayashor be enough. Everybody did whatever they wanted. You can interpret it positively, but, but the simple context of the verse is that the, the Navi is really describing anarchy and lawlessness and disrespect for Hashem and Hashem's Torah because there was no leadership. And in connection with that, it gives us a story that is truly horrifying, but it makes a fascinating political point. And that is, at the end of the book of Judges, there was a man who was traveling with his concubine and he wandered into the territory of the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, he got himself lodgings, and she was kind of left outside. And that night, uh, she was raped and attacked by many people, gang raped, so to speak, and she was left for dead. And the next morning, he comes out, and he finds this woman killed, murdered. So what he does, again, what he, what he himself does is a very bizarre thing. He cuts her up into 12 pieces. He kind of sends a piece to each tribe and saying, do something about this. They violated her. They murdered her. There must be justice. So the tribes 
demanded that Shevet bin Yamin identify and extradite the wrongdoers. Shevet bin Yamin refused to do that. So you know what happened? There actually was a civil war in which all of the tribes declared war against bin Yamin. And the tribe of bin Yamin, which of course was greatly outnumbered, but they managed to, to fight, but they were almost totally decimated. Very, very few Binyaminites were left, and even those that were left, the people, the Jewish people made a vow that no man shall give his daughter to a Binyaminite, which would have meant, in a relatively short time, an entire tribe of Israel would have become extinct. Now, we don't realize, because we don't have such a tribal identification, because most of us don't know what tribe we're from, that this is actually a cosmic tragedy, because you have to understand that God's covenant with the Jewish people are not only with the Jewish people as a whole, but there's a covenant with each tribe. And if one tribe is missing, that's it. That's why the Gemara actually says we have a promise from God that not only will the Jewish people never be destroyed, but there will always be remnants of every tribe. There will never be an entire tribe that is wiped out. Now, uh, eventually this vow was annulled, and in fact, according to tradition, the date that this vow was annulled that nobody would marry Binyaminites, was the 15th of Av. And one of the reasons why you may have heard that the 15th of Av is a very, very joyous day is because that is when the tribes were able to freely marry into each other again, and that's a great, great source of simcha. Those of you that are fans of uh, Da Vinci Code-type literature uh, may have come across uh, an actual statement uh, that uh, some historians have posited that the tr there, there were large numbers of the tribe of Benjaminites who, because of this war, they fled the land of Israel and they settled in France and England. And in fact, the official history of the royal family of Great Britain, United Kingdom, is that they are actually descended. They, they claim Jewish, they don't claim they're Jewish, obviously, they're Church of England, but they claim that they are descended from the Binyaminites. Now, some people consider this to be crazy, Dan Brown type, you know, made up, made up stuff. But the truth of the matter is there are some Makoros, there are some sources in Mephorshim. Uh, some of them even seem to have chazals that we don't really have, but they, they seem to be quoting Midrashim that actually talk about a large group of Binyaminites fleeing to the European continent and settling there. This is way, I mean, this is way before there was even a base of remember, see, remember how early this is. This is not after the destruction of the temple. This is before the building of the temple. This goes all the way back and the like. Now, why, why am I digressing with this very, very sad uh, story? Because Ramban offers a very interesting comment. Why didn't Shevet Binyamin simply turn over the bad guys? We're not assuming the whole tribe was evil and corrupt. That wouldn't be right. So the Ramban says there was a matter of principle here. Shevet bin Yamin looked at every tribe as a sovereign nation. Yes, we're united because we have the same religion. But just like La Havdil, you know, you can be a Catholic in France and you can be a Catholic uh, in Germany. So too, you can be a Jew in the country of bin Yamin and a Jew in the country of Yehuda. And therefore, they argued, you have no right to demand extradition of wrongdoers. Every tribe has the sovereign authority to try its own wrongdoers. So really, the civil war was fought. This civil war was fought as a matter of to establish the idea, the Ramban says, that the Jewish people are one nation. They are not a bunch of separate countries that are united by a religion, but they are a nation. And what happens with any segment is relevant to the whole nation. Now, without getting too far afield, this was the identical issue, Lahavdil, of the American Civil War. Uh, it is a, a mistake to say that Lincoln fought the Civil War over the issue of slavery. Yes, it is true that the South had slavery and the North didn't have slavery. It's also true that Lincoln was personally against slavery. Uh, you know, he thought it was a very bad thing, but he would not uh, have brought the United States into war over slavery. The, ma the main issue was secession, mm -hmm. where the southern states took the position that every state is its own mm -hmm. government, 
and we have the right to leave this union because we're not part of one country. In fact, the word state in international law means a country. You talk about the state of Israel, the state of whatever it is. I mean, the technical word for what we call the state would be a province. Right? The fact that United States, and in fact, reporters, uh, historians have said a very fascinating grammatical point. Before the Civil War, the words United States were a plural noun. The United States have in mind states. After the Civil War, it became a singular noun. The United States is. Very, very interesting, a different concept. So the point that you see from all of this is that tribes are a big deal. Now, today, our tribal consciousness is very, very attenuated. Unless you're a Cohen or a Levy, and even then you're not sure. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know if I'm from a Ruvain or a Shimon or Yehuda, or Yisachar. And let me just clarify, because you might be thinking, well, wait a second here. Don't we talk about the 10 tribes being exiled, the lost 10 tribes? And they were exiled 100, more than 100 years before the destruction of the temple, and the only tribes that remained was Yehuda and Binyamin and Levium. So doesn't that mean, by definition, if I'm not a Kohen or a Levi, I got to be from Yehuda and Binyamin? No, that's actually not true, because although it is true that the kingdom of the ten tribes was destroyed, it was always the case that there had been migration, and within the southern kingdom of the two tribes, there were people from all sorts of tribes. Moreover, there are some opinions that even say the ten tribes themselves were reunited. We're not sure there are different opinions in the Gemara, but the point that you need to know is any one of us that is not a Kohen or a Levi we could be any one of the other tribes. You can be a Yisachar or a Zavolin or an Ephraim or a Menashe. So, but nevertheless, since we don't know our tribe, so our whole sense of tribal consciousness is very attenuated. And yet, in the Torah, it seems to be a big deal. So the question, and of course, when Mashiach comes, it'll be a big deal again. The redivision of the land in accordance with tribes, that's going to happen again. It's not going to be the same boundaries, interestingly enough. We have the boundaries in the book of Yehoshua, which were the initial boundaries. Uh, but in the book of Yechezkel, there will be a different division of the land, but it will still be a tribal division. Did you want to? Well, so our original tribes will have no relevance in the time of Mashiach. Well, the tribes will be the same tribes, but, but uh, the land they will get will not be the land they got in the time of Yeshua. They, they, will, they will get separate. We will discover the tribe that we will Yes, 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 you will, yes. So the question I want to raise is, why is tribes even a good thing? I mean, isn't it just another factor that introduces disunity and disharmony among the people? I'm a Jew. Without our tribal affiliation, there's enough division that we fight over. So now we're bringing in something else. I'm a Reuven, I'm a Shimon. I mean, we're all Jews. Isn't that all that matters? Why is there a whole concept of Shvatim and, and Nesim and Degolim? Degolim are flags. And Chalakim in Eretz Yisrael. You can't live here because, you know, this belongs to Yisachar and you're supposed to be somewhere else. What is that? So the truth of the matter is there actually is something very profound that is being communicated here. And that is... When we talk about community, we talk about achtos, we talk about unity, we talk about togetherness, we talk about coming together as one, there are two different ways you can describe that. And I'm going to use a secular expression. There is the achtos that comes via a melting pot, and there's the achtos that comes via a salad bowl. There is melting pot unity, and there is salad bowl unity. Melting pot unity, which was the model that applied, let's say, in the United States uh, in the uh, first half, first two-thirds maybe of the 20th century. And unfortunately, it was applied in the state of Israel uh, for the first uh, two or three decades after the founding of the state, is based on the concept that if you want to create a community, you must obliterate differences and distinctiveness. Give up your culture, give up your language, just become like the prevailing culture. A melting pot, 
all of the differences get burnt away. Think about cholent, right? Cholent, okay, cholent initially might be meat and barley and potatoes, but by the time it's Tuesday or Wednesday into the next week, you got a glop that is indistinguishable. That is what melting pot is based on. Melting pot is based on a model that communities are created by obliterating individuality and becoming one. A salad bowl is a different type of unity. There you have, even if it's Israeli salad that's cut up very small, but still, you know, uh, you got lettuce, you got tomatoes, you got peppers, you got onions, you got mushrooms, whatever you, whatever you put in. Different colors, different textures, different types of tastes. There may be an acidity and there may be a sweetness and there may be a sourness and saltiness, whatever it would be. That you create the beauty of molding disparate ingredients together in which each one has its own individuality. But the beauty is the harmonization of that individuality to create a whole that is greater than the sum of the individual parts. That's a very different model than the melting pot. The melting pot obliterates individuality. It achieves community by destroying the individual. The salad bowl creates community by celebrating and accentuating the uniqueness of each contributor. Now, you can use a lot of different metaphors to describe this. I use the food metaphor, salad bowl, but we can talk about a symphony, that the beauty of a musical composition is not repeating the same note a hundred times but it's precisely through the harmonization of all of these different elements. Or you can talk about a tapestry, or you can talk about a mosaic, there, any type of metaphor you use. Or a garden. The beauty of a garden is not when you simply have the same flower a million times. If you were to have a million roses, that, you know, that may be pretty on some level. But it's surely not as beautiful as seeing different colors and different fragrances coming together. This, Rabosai, is what we mean by tribes. We are one nation. We have one Torah. We have one God. But God does not want our community to be predicated on a blindless destruction of the individual. Each Shevet, each tribe, has a unique mission, a unique way it connected to God. The role of Yisachar, for example, is said to be the full-time Torah student and Zavolin, who also had to learn, rest assured, devoted, was involved in business and commerce. What is Yaakov Avinu saying? There is not a sameness here. Each person connects to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in their own unique way with a common commitment to Torah. And that creates the beauty of the Jewish people. And by extension, therefore, if there is a concept of tribal uh, individuality, it also applies to us as individuals as well. Now, this creates some difficulties. Because like anything else, if you take one idea to the extreme without combining it with the other idea, there is going to be distortion. So for example, if I take the notion of individuality to an extreme, you don't have a community. Everybody's doing their own thing. Everyone, what did they say? You know, um, a few years ago in the state of Washington, there was supposed to be an anarchist convention, a convention of anarchists who were protesting the World Trade Organization. Right? The World Trade Organization was trying to make kind of a worldwide rules for trade, and the anarchists felt there shouldn't be such rules. But the anarchist demonstration couldn't take off because they were anarchists. They couldn't get organized. <laughs> kind of interesting paradox. How do anarchists, how do you have an anarchist organization? Can't do it, basically. <laughs> I'm an anarchist. You don't tell me what to do. So, so the problem basically is, the problem basically is that individuality, if taken to an extreme, number one, becomes extremely narcissistic. Even in religious matters, meaning you kind of identify, oh, uh, I will, I will do for God what makes me feel happy, elevated, spiritual. That's a new age spirituality. What makes you feel good. The problem there is, everybody does their own thing. There is no religion. There is no community. And number two, are you serving God? 
or are you serving yourself? If religion is defined by whatever makes me feel good, then that's a pretty egotistic religion. The God that I'm serving is me, not serving God. What did they say? There was a um, Harvey Cox, who was a, a professor at Harvard. He was a, a Protestant professor of theology. He wrote a book about religion in America. And in one of his, uh, one of his uh, people that he interviewed was a woman named Sheila. And Sheila said she believes in God, but she does not believe in organized religion. So the religion she practices is Sheilaism. Mm -hmm. So I once heard from a, a very, very uh, uh, intelligent rabbi that he said that it's lucky that her name wasn't Judy <laughs> or the religion she would have practiced would be Judaism. Mm. Now, in truth, as a matter of fact, that's exactly how Judea Judaism is often practiced, even by people whose name isn't Judy. And that is, whatever I think is, hey, I'm Jewish, and I think X, Y, and Z, so that's Jewish philosophy. I'm a Jew that has a philosophy equals Jewish philosophy. Right? Uh, but obviously, Judaism is also about submission to God, and it's about the formation of community. But the point is, it is not about obliteration of individuality. That is the lesson of the tribes, that you achieve community precisely through fostering your individuality in a relationship of cooperation and love and submission to God as well as to the Jewish people. Now, that's a challenge because it's easy to go to one extreme and say, I will just be a conformist. Although I, I won't call that easy because eventually it gets very, very frustrating inside. Or it's easy to say, I'll just march to my own drummer. But to march to your own drummer and at the same time be part of the band, that's a bit of a challenge. That is the walking on a tightrope. Judaism never has the easy way because it requires that you take the good from both sides of the equation and bring them together and integrate them. So this is the big challenge. Now, I know you might be thinking, hey, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm now talking about Orthodox Torah Judaism as you know, fostering the creativity of the individual. I don't see it that way. I just see rule after rule after rule and ritual and ritual, ritual after ritual. And uh, a lot of people dress the same, you know, dress in black and white or, or, or whatever. Oh, the I see we don't, you see we don't impose a, a rigid standard there either. Uh, but, you know, if I would be thinking about things that liberate the individual, Torah Judaism might not be the first thing I would intuitively assume does that. But you see, that, that's a very big mistake. Uh, there was a great poet, non-Jewish, uh, an Indian poet, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in the 1920s, Tagore. And Tagore was not writing about Judaism. I don't even know how many Jews he knew. But he once described the human soul in a very vivid and beautiful way. He said, every human soul has deep and beautiful music within that soul. We are like a violin string. Now imagine a violin string that I simply take off the violin and I put it on the kitchen table. It's totally free, liberated, unencumbered, not tied down. What type of music can you get from a totally liberated violin string? You can't get anything at all. When you tie it down and you seemingly confine it and you enslave it, no, metaphorically speaking, that's when the music within comes out. And Tagari said, this is a metaphor for human existence. We think unlimited freedom will let me become the person I'm able to become. Let me achieve the beauty that is within me. But freedom without that direction, without that framework, without that guidance, nothing comes out. Even secularly, you know, this is very, very true. You know, if you ever listen to a jazz musician, that's doing improvisation, doing riffs, as these are just amazing, spontaneous things. And, you know, 
you want to do that. So you go out and you buy a trombone and you immediately just want to start blowing sounds because that's all he's doing. He's just blowing sounds. Nothing good is really going to come out. Keep in mind that before you do those improvisations, uh, there was a time where that musician probably had to spend a lot of time playing scales and doing grunt work and doing routine things and doing things that just seemed to be routinized. All creativity and spontaneity comes because there was a mastery and a discipline and a submission. Before Picasso could paint the abstract paintings, he had to draw all sorts of regular things. I mean, he was a natural genius as well. So you have to understand that indeed, the ultimate goal is each of us develops our own unique relationship to God. We fly. But in order to do that, we need to have knowledge. We need to have skills. We need to have a framework. We need to be tied down to the violin so the music within us can be expressed. Right, so this is the paradox of life, uh, that you need to be enslaved, that's a strong word, in order to be free. The one who thinks he's free is really a slave. And the one who knows he's a slave to the Almighty actually becomes free. And this is what Chazal say. The truth is, Chazal say it explicitly in Perkei Avos. Ein ben Chorin el ami sha'osek batorah. It's a Chazal in Perkei Avos. No one is truly free except the one who learns and by extension lives by the Torah. And that's not just a homily or a nice thing to say. It's recognizing that freedom needs to be linked to commitment and discipline that goes beyond your self-gratification. Because when you live for hedonistic pleasures, whatever makes me feel good, you're not free. You're a slave to yourself. And that's the biggest enslaver, where I simply can't control myself. Wherever I feel is what pulls me. It's as if there's something in you that's just making you do this and making you do that. That is not freedom. Freedom is when a five-year-old kid who's offered a candy, a five-year-old, can say, can't take it because it's not kosher. How many five-year-olds are capable of that? Freedom is when you want to do something that's not so good because everybody else that you know is doing it, and you say no. Or you do something good even if everyone else you know is not doing it, but you do it because it's the right thing. That's a free person. A free person is a person who is strong enough to make decisions that are not always going to be popular, that aren't always going to be accepted. That is what a free person is. To simply go with the crowd or go with your gut or go with your feelings or go with whatever you want to do, that's not freedom. That's simply being enslaved. You can be enslaved by other people. You can be enslaved by, by your own negativities. Okay, so this is the, the paradox. Judaism is very much about creating my own individual connection with the Almighty, but within the framework of submission to HaKadosh Baruch And this, I would suggest to you, is the paradox and the paradigm of why there are 12 individual tribes within the collectivity of Am Yisrael. Hashem doesn't want a cholent, a melting pot of the Jewish people. Hashem wants a salad bowl, tapestry, mosaic, symphony of Am Yisrael. And that's why, although by definition, the introduction of the concept of tribes brings in a potential for disunity and polarization when it's taken to an extreme, like, like the story of the Benjaminites who took their tribal affiliation and kind of said, we're separating from the nation. In point of fact, it is the highest, greatest, deepest level of unity and community where each can learn from the other, each contributes according to their uniqueness. That is why within the Torah world, there have been and there still are many, many beautiful strands, whether it's Hasidus, uh, whether it's uh, Musr, uh, whether it's rationalism, like the Rambam's tradition, whether it's Kabbalah, the mystical tradition. And none of these are false. 
because there are many, many legitimate, now again, I'm not dealing right now with what are illegitimate ways, there are such a thing like that as well, but there are many, many legitimate ways of coming to God, all of which are predicated on keeping the Torah. The Torah is like the minimum that you need, but once you have Torah, then there are many, many different ways of coming to God, and each person is supposed to try to discover the way that is most appropriate that is best for them, that feeds their soul, that gives their soul sustenance and nutrition. Okay, so that was uh, one thought I, I wanted to share with you, kind of the, the important role of Shvatim and how that uh, applies to us as individuals. Now, another thought I want to share with you is that in Yaakov's blessings, so there is, of course, uh, a special blessing given to the tribe of Yehuda. Actually, that's not a tribe yet, but to Yehuda as a person, which goes over to his tribe. And this is halakhically a, a very, very important pasuk. It says, Lo yasur shevet mi Yehuda, the scepter of authority shall never depart from the tribe of Yehuda. And what Yaakov Avinu is doing here is, Yaakov Avinu is actually saying that the kingship and the monarchy of the Jewish people shall be given to the tribe of Yehuda. That is why David HaMelech and the whole Davidic line, including Mashiach, come from the tribe of Yehuda. In fact, uh, there's a very, very, we just had Hanukkah. There's a very, very famous discussion of the Ramban, Taka, in this week's Parsha, where the Ramban talks about the ignominious destruction of the Hasmonean dynasty. The heroes of the Hanukkah story are the Maccabees. The Maccabees are from the family known as the Chashmonaim. And the Chashmonaim were tzaddikim. They were righteous. They were holy. They were able to defeat the Yavanim and rededicate the Beis HaMikdash and reestablish the Torah. And they established an independent Hasmonean state in Eretz Yisrael that lasted for more than 150 years till the Romans came in. And yet, paradoxically, the Hasmoneans were utterly wiped out. There is no remnant of them. And the Ramban says, how could it be so that such righteous people were utterly destroyed? And the Ramban writes, because they did one sin. And the sin was, when they defeated the Yavanim, they made themselves monarchs. They proclaimed themselves, and were proclaimed, as the kings. And that was not proper, because Malchus has to go to the tribe of Yehuda, a descendant of David HaMelech. And they should have looked for such a descendant. They should, after they won the war, they should have abdicated. Right? And the Ramban says that was sinful, because they violated Lo Yasur, Shevet, Mi Yehuda. Now, it's true that throughout the biblical period, from, from Shlomo HaMelech's son, Rechavam, there were, in fact, two kingdoms, right? The southern kingdom was ruled by the Davidic line. The northern kingdom was ruled by the Israelite kings, and they were not from the Davidic line. Well, it's very true. The Ramban says that, in fact, was sinful. The Ramban says the whole institution of Malchei Yisrael was, in fact, a violation of this law. Again, I have to say the Ramban is a very big chiddish because although it is true that many of the Israelite kings were not righteous. In fact, most of them were not. But it never indicates in the Nevi'im that their sin was the mere fact that they were king. Their sin was idolatry. Their sin was murder. The Ramban is mechadesh, that it's not only what they did that was bad. It was the very fact they remained as kings that were bad. They should have gone back to the Davidic line. That's actually a very big chiddish, and the psukim uh, do not imply that so clearly, but this is what the Ramban says. Malchus is given to the tribe of Yehuda. The question you might raise is that if we were to ask to choose which brother would be most suitable for Malchus, we might have thought Yosef would be a pretty logical choice. Mm -hmm. On a superficial level, Yosef has executive experience, right? We're always looking for experience. He knew, like people say in the presidency, you know, I was a governor, I can be president, and I know how to run a budget, etc. Yeah. Uh, even Donald Trump, I run, you know, million dollar, billion dollar businesses. So Yosef ran a country. 
Politically, he has experience. More importantly, spiritually. Yosef was the one who was able to survive all of the trials and tribulations. He both uh, lived the life of a slave and he remained faithful to Hashem and then he reached the pinnacle of power which is even a bigger challenge and he remained faithful to Hashem. He didn't become arrogant. He didn't leave HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Yosef is the role model against sin. Why not pick Yosef? So it's very, very interesting that uh, a, a thought that the Hasidic Svarim say, the Sfas Emes, other Svarim of Tzadok, they say the following. A Melech is supposed to be a spiritual role model. Now, that's not to say every king was a spiritual role model. We certainly had bad kings. There's no question about it. Uh, many, many kings were, were not good. But the th in theory, what Hashem wants in a Melech is Hashem wants a Melech that will not just be a political leader, but will inspire us, will teach us, not so much by his formal teaching, because a melech is not uh, a magid shir in a yeshiva, but will teach us by the nobility of his life how to serve Hashem in a proper way. Yosef would not have been the perfect role model for us in that way, precisely because he is so perfect. When Yosef is confronted with very, very powerful sexual temptation, when Potiphar's wife really wants him, Yosef has the unbelievable strength to just say no, to quote Nancy Reagan. Yosef represents the tzaddik who, when he is confronted with the Yetzir Hara, just overpowers it, ignores it, doesn't listen to it. That's phenomenal. That is why he is called Yosef Hatzadik. But in many ways, to have a role model who is so strong that he succumbs all temptations is not an ideal role model for us because I look at people who are models of perfection and I say, that's not me. I mess up. I make mistakes. I fail. Yehuda, when Yehuda faces the same Nisayon of a woman, it happens to be his daughter-in-law, but he doesn't know that. It's a prostitute. And he's nichshel, and he succumbs. And then he sees his daughter-in-law pregnant, and he thinks she committed adultery with somebody, and he's about to burn her at the stake, and she would not reveal his identity, not to humiliate him. She just says, the man that gave me this deposit, so to speak, is the man, and then he realizes it's him. And he says, she is more righteous than me than I am. Yehuda represents the model of the person who sometimes fails, sometimes makes mistakes, but teaches us that even when you fail, you don't give up hope, you don't throw in the towel, you get up again, you do tshuva, you come back to God. That was the role model that Hashem wanted us to see in a flesh and blood king because we all make mistakes. But what happens sometimes is, we sometimes think, oh, I've made mistakes already. What's the use? I'm beyond repair. I might as well keep on going in the way that I'm going. Yehuda teaches us that Hashem does not demand perfection, but Hashem demands that when we do mess up, we get up again. And we try to fix the next day and even the next minute. And therefore, that is the lesson. You know, there's a whole genre in uh, Jewish, uh, you know, English literature about gedolim biographies, biographies of great rabbis. And, you know, you know, we have biographies of all sorts of great rabbis, and, this, you know, I, I enjoy this myself. Uh, but Rav Hutner, the great Rav Hutner, once complained that gedolim biographies all sounded the same. They talk about f the phenomenal genius of the four-year-old, you know. When he was three, he knew Chumash, and when, when he was four, he finished the Talmud. And when he was five, he did the Yerushalmi, and you know, et, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these stories are actually true. Some of them are not. Some of them are true. I mean, the, some, of, some of the rabbis were phenomenally brilliant in amazing ways. But Rav Hutner said, those are great, great stories. But in some way, they can't really inspire you. Because you look at that, you just say, they're so different than I am. So I just admire them in awe. 
but it doesn't call upon me to be anything because I can't be that. But Rav Huttner said, there may be something under the surface that we're not aware of. We're not aware of the struggles these people have. Were there times that they had questions? We know the Chafetz Chaim in his 70s and 80s and older trained himself to fall asleep if someone spoke Lashon Hara. That's how attuned he was. But what was the Chafetz Chaim when he was 15 or 16? We don't realize that Gedolim are not just born, even if they're born with great mental abilities. Mental abilities do not make you a Gadol. It's a helpful characteristic to have, but it's, not, it's certainly not a sufficient characteristic, and it may not even be a necessary characteristic. A person becomes great because they work on themselves. Rav Moshe Feinstein, who was the most gentlest of people, once said, I don't know if it's true, but he said it. He said that by nature, he had a very bad temper. He get, got angry at people for all the time. But he said he worked on himself to become a different person. And Rav Huttner said, sometimes the true greatness of a person is not when you simply look at the finished product, but when you see the struggles and the mistakes and the failures and how a person didn't get crushed from those failures, but went on again. That's a message I can hear because I mess up and I fail. I need to hear that you can keep on going and you don't get discouraged. And that is why Hashem wanted kingship to come from a person who failed and stumbled but came back to God even more so than the person who never made a mistake. Okay, because one person is so beyond me I can't connect, the other could be a role model. So uh, that, that's what the Pusuk says in Tehillim, I'm sorry, in Mishlei, very famous Pusuk in Proverbs, Ki sheva yipo tzaddik v'kam. The righteous man falls seven times, many, many times. But the key is, he always gets up. He doesn't allow his spirit to be broken. And that is how he becomes great. Okay, so I wish you uh, all well and have a good, good week, a good Shabbos, and take care.